Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Mix Tank on PureMix.net. My name is Mark Abrams, and I'm here. I've been here every Monday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern uh, for the last couple months, and we're going to start off with a little bit of an announcement. Uh, we are going to be moving the stream to bi-monthly. So I'll be here every other Monday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern giving comments on your mixes. So um, next week we'll be off. Uh, there's a holiday here in the U.S. Um, called Labor Day. So um, I think it's against the law if I labor. I don't think that that's true at all, but um, I won't be here next Monday, uh, but I will be back the, the week after that. So in the in-between weeks, we're going to be doing another stream, and that is going to be uh, where I'm moving my plug-in show to a live stream format. So if you've ever seen the great big plug-in show on our uh, YouTube channel, that's going to now be a live stream. And the kicker for that is that I'm not going to check out the plugin before the live stream. So I'm going to discover it on camera with you guys, and we'll be chatting back and forth in the chat room to um, do things that you guys want to hear it do and just figure it all out together. So that should be pretty fun. We'll do it in a live format instead of one where I kind of know the plugin going in. So I'll be discovering features and all that live. Um, to start off the stream for today, I've been opening up all of these live streams with a little bit of a rundown of a song, uh, a mix that I love, or um, a song that I find inspirational that I think is going to be of use to you guys if you review it. So today, to start off, we're going to be talking about Bjork's Hunter. So if, uh, if you're not familiar with Bjork, go check her out. She's incredible. Uh, extraordinarily creative, as you can tell from the album art. And I, um, I got the uh, opportunity or the pleasure to like see Bjork live. Um, I think it was 2018, maybe. It was um, Midpoint Music Fest in London. And she was headlining one night, so we went to go see her. And as she was taking the stage, um, for it was for her latest record where she turns herself into a bird. It's awesome. Um, as she was taking the stage, there was this thunderstorm that was coming off uh, in the distance. And it was a bunch of heat lightning. And it wasn't raining on us, but there was just tons of heat lightning. And the sky looked insane. And it was so fitting that it started exactly as Bjork took the stage and emerged from some sort of egg as a bird. So that's to set the tone for, um, for the Bjork song that we're talking about. But yeah, so this is Hunter. And Hunter came out in 1997. I think that that's an extremely important point for anybody who goes to check this out now because it doesn't sound like 1997. There's no Grinch guitars. It wasn't something that was in, you know, in vogue at the time, although Bjork was doing just fine. Um, it was very unique and very ahead of its time, in my opinion. This was mixed by Spike Stent. So uh, this is also an interesting thing to kind of go back in time almost 20 years and look at the work that Spike was doing at that time, which was absolutely out of this world, of course. And OK, so to start it off, the song opens up. There's a lot of low end happening on the sides. There's all of these electronic drums that are going on. Um, and it's a lot of low end on the sides uh, compared to kind of what we're used to. And it all makes sense when the low bass enters and it's completely up the center and it's freaking huge. It's massive and uh, pretty awesome. Nice. Great Fox. Good to see you in here. That makes that makes total sense that you love this. Um, so uh, the lots of low end right up the center, um, which it can do because there's so much on the sides and it left space for it. Uh, there's also a lot of... Um, I call them like mono point sources, but mono synths that happen throughout the sound field. Um, but they're very specific and very, uh, very narrow, right? So they're, they're in mono and just pan to uh, specific points, which is something that um, I love. I talked about it last week when we, when we kind of went over the Kanye West song. And it leaves so much space for things that happen in stereo. But it's also just kind of different from a lot of the stuff that I've been hearing on uh, Mix Tank and then also just in, in modern mixes too because we have so many tools that add width to everything and uh, they're really fun and addictive to add on the stuff. But when something is left completely in mono and it has a very specific point in the stereo field, it, um, 
it just leaves all this room for other things to happen around it and leaves, you know, kind of blank space in the canvas, if you will. So that's something that happens here. And the first one that comes up almost sounds like a reversed accordion, which is kind of cool. And then as we kind of move into verse one, the electronic tom that's happening over on the right side turns into the papery snare sound that uh, the song is, um, I think it's like a key element in the song and, and a lot of people would identify it as that. Uh, as that the, as the song evolves, that snare evolves with it, and it feels like a sample that they're changing the decay on, um, and they're they're lengthening it and then shortening it, and it's this constantly evolving electronic snare sound that almost sounds acoustic, but uh, the way that they're manipulating it is pretty amazing as it goes on. Um, the background vocals in uh, in verse one are pretty mono, but they have some pretty gorgeous stereo reverb. And the cool thing that I found with that verb is that they're they're definitely doing a lot of automation. And when it's more bare, they kind of bring the verb up to give some width to those background vocals. But then as things like the cellos enter, they bring it back a bit and make space for those things to come in. So the cellos and the strings enter after verse one. And a cool thing happens after that. And uh, it's the first time that she says, I'm the hunter. And any time that she says that in the song, the vocal goes completely bone dry and it's full range, whereas the, the lead vocal is very filtered with a really cool mono delay up it uh, around that. She goes full range, bone dry, right up the center. You can't ignore it. And I thought that the contrast of that is important to mention because it pulls you away from uh, your ears kind of gotten used to this like filtered delay sounding vocal and then she goes bone dry and it's like your ears instantly like something changed what changed i need to know it changed um so i thought that that was cool in chorus one around 144 the vocal goes full range and it's really loud so all the vocals are pretty loud in this chorus and it pulls your attention away from all the low end elements that are happening almost gives a bit of a um, relief from like the low droney stuff that's going on because you start focusing on the vocals and then uh, these background vocals sweep in. They're kind of sweeping left to right. And it's honestly a little bit bitey. But as it goes into verse two, the filtered vocal remake or comes back. It's right up the center. And now we have accordions and what sounds like a phase synth. Or it might be the, the accordions again, just with a phaser on them. It's pretty neat. And the filter vocal also gets a little phasey at times. So it's just a lot of automation happening here in 1997. So... That's that's pretty awesome. There's a lot of like actual personality of somebody playing the mix inside of this mix. Um, so I don't know what the significance of the I am the hunter um, being full range and dry is lyrically, but it definitely forces you to listen into it. The um, the background vocals kind of move from a wide uh, spread into a center for verse two. And uh, that mono delay that's on the filtered leave in, in verse two also has some of the coolest automation ever. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that goes on in the mix. Um, on the outro, that right papery marching snare drum kind of comes up in level. And the, as the bass leaves, the background vocals, the ooze come forward, they get a little bit wider. And uh, yeah, there's just a whole lot of personality inside of this mix. And I think um, it's a lesson in making all of these different moments matter. It's also one of the most masterful blending of electronic and organic instruments that I can think of. Uh, it's, it's just done so well with it. And as far as um, lyrically, I found a thing online that said, um, lyrically, Bjork bathed Hunter in allegory. And the artist had said that Hunter manifested the pressure she felt to deliver music as the monetary provider for her musical nest or family. Uh, when you're an artist as significant as Bjork, an entire financial ecosystem depends on your creativity. So for her, she was going out and hunting creativity. And you kind of have um, this feeling of that as, as like the song evolves and she's just trying all these different things. I love Bjork. Uh, she's incredible. And that song is definitely worth checking out. And there's so many things that we can pull from it from a mixing perspective. Speaking of mixing, we're going to go over to Mix Tank and check out some of your mixes. How's that for transitions? Okay. So if you're unfamiliar, this is Mix Tank. It's on puremix.net. If you're watching the stream for the first time, wondering how you submit your mix, 
Mix Tank is available for Pure Mix Pro members, and you log into the site with your regular account, click on Mix Up at the top, and then you can click on Submit My Mix, or Submit a Mix up here at the top. Uh, so over on the left, we've got a bunch of mixes submitted by the Pure Mix community. In the center, you can see a timeline. This one says no feedback yet, but if there were comments on it, we would see time-stamped comments as it goes on. Think SoundCloud. And then uh, over on the right, we've got some information about the user as well as some notes that they will put in there from time to time if they're uh, looking for help with a certain element of the mix and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to hit refresh here and see if my uh, draw a track button is going to work today. So give me one second to see why that's not coming in and we'll, we'll get started. So the way that we're, um, we're going to take Mon take mixes today is is random and once in a while our randomize button doesn't like to work for us so if that happens today we're gonna first hit everybody that is live in the stream like we did last week uh, and try to get to as many as we can today all right so my random button's not coming up so here's what we're gonna do I'm gonna try it one more time but if you're here and you submitted a mix please let me know in the YouTube chat and I'm going to watch that thing like a hawk throughout the stream, and we'll hit your mixes uh, if, you, if you were able to show up today. Uh, Great Fox says that when Bjork's vocals go dry, she turns into a bear in the video, if I remember right. Yeah, she totally, yeah, I w actually watched the video before the stream, and um, again, 1997, like the CGI that was involved is actually pretty good. It looks a little 90s, but it's pretty awesome. Uh, okay, let me try this button thing one more time. And if not, we'll just jump in. So, boom. I'm just clicking on a thing in the uh, on my screen over here. Very exciting. Okay, refresh and still no draw track button. Make sure this is saved. One more time. Draw track. Okay, here we go. Draw on a track. So. Okay, great. This is from an hour ago too. So it looks like our draw a track button is working today. I'm gonna, I'll go back and, and look for some of these uh, mixes that are in the comments as well, but we'll, we'll start off by doing a couple draw tracks. So um, this one is from uh, Massilius. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, you can correct me in the comments. This is the opening version 56. Fingers crossed, it'll be mine. So hopefully, you, uh, yeah, for the getting chosen on here. But I saw you in the chat earlier, so awesome. Great, yes, I see you. Um, so, uh, Masiak says in the YouTube comments, I'm here and would love that you comment on my mix. I was never picked and I tried five or six times. Today's the day, let's do it. All right, uh, I'm gonna dive in, here we go.
I'm gonna check one thing on the end here. Cool, I was just listening for timing there. Um, awesome track, Macy. Yeah, thank you so much for submitting. Uh, very, very cool. That was a fun groove. Um, I went back to check something in the bridge there, so that wasn't things skipping. That was me me jumping back in time. So, um, yeah, very cool. I think uh, there's some really good comments going on in the YouTube chat here. Um, you guys, make sure you, like, jump in, throw your comments on there. Very, very cool. Um, this is all about community. So, yeah, everybody get in. Um, awesome. So the main thing that I'm hearing is uh, those main guitars, like the the main melody riff that's doing the sort of spy theme um, surf guitar line on there. Those guys feel very loud in the mix to me. And it's it's um, it makes sense that they're going to be up there because they're obviously the main melody or main element of the mix at that point, And it's kind of like the vocal almost. Um, so it makes sense that they're up but I feel like they're a little disjointed from the rest of the music where they're so far out front that we can't hear a lot of the other amazing production stuff that you put in there um, with all these like burbling, burgling, gurgling synths, um, the bass line stuff that's happening in there. Uh, there's a whole lot of really awesome stuff that you've added into the production that is kind of way in the background because of how forward that guitar is. So I think maybe bringing him down in volume is going to pull him a little bit closer to the other other months and he'll still maintain authority. I think he just needs to um, let everybody else be heard a little bit, if that makes sense. So uh, around 309, I was starting to feel like that guitar felt a little more balanced. It's not as aggressive of a, of a part either. So just I think like some automation is going to be your friend here, just riding a fader of that guitar and, and keeping it keeping it well balanced with the rest of the track. Um, the uh, kick drum, I was feeling like you have a nice powerful kick in there. There's a lot of cool uh, percussive elements that are happening in the, in the electronic drums. Um, but I was feeling like the bass and the synths should kind of be coming up and wrapping around that a little bit so that it's not quite as exposed and you, again, get to hear some more of that really cool stuff that's going on. Uh, I also felt like at times I could use a little bit more snare on the backbeat, um, but there's also a little bit of a stylistic thing there. Everything is taste and, and personal choice, of course, so uh, you decide uh, what the right move is there. Uh, back to the guitar, um, there's some compression that's going on with it, and it almost feels like a pedal compressor to me. Um, there's Pedal compressors have... Uh, I don't want to call it a slow attack, but they always kind of let a bit of the pick sound through to me and they get a little bit jagged uh, if they're if they're like kind of pushed a little too hard. So I don't know that this is a pedal compressor. It has that sound to me, which would tell me like either the guitar could just benefit from less compression or a slightly faster attack to get some of that initial transient spike that can kind of jump out and like kind of flick your ear a little bit um, just to get that to chill a little bit. So again, like removing some of the compression might fix this as well, because if you have uh, just a slow enough attack to let that initial peak pop through, but then it just clamps down on the rest of the sustain of the note, that could be causing it as well. So uh, if it's a plug-in, back it off. If not, um, see if you can just tame that initial transient a little bit. Uh, in the bridge, we lose the kick, which is a arrangement choice, but it starts to come back and it feels a little bit weak before the drop happens um, a little bit later in the song. So I don't know if there's something else uh, to be done there um, production wise to start building it back up into that drop um, or just something to make it all feel a little bit more connected. But things felt like they thinned out for quite a while in that bridge thing. Um, just something that, you know, just a reaction really, um, to what, what I was hearing, but yeah, again, like just make some more moments here where you can bring some things up around, um, the hats and percussion that are still kind of loud in that section. Uh, you have a lot of, a lot of room there to make some more interesting moments happen. Um, yeah. So the kick came back at the 440 drop. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of all I, all I really like had off of first impression stuff for that. I hope it's I hope it's useful. Um, and yeah, other cool comments happening in there. Yeah, really cool effects around the edges, says Jeff. Totally agree. That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to drop my comment here. And there we go.
So yeah, for anybody new to Mixed Tank, you'll see I dropped that comment at five minutes, 30 seconds. And uh, if you're watching this later, you wouldn't need me to tell you how to get the link. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to draw another track here. Let's see what we get. I see you guys in the chat too. We'll, uh, we'll hit up um, some of these mixes in a second here. Uh, so the next one that came up, Studio G-Man. Um, he's posted tracks on here a couple times and they're always freaking awesome. So I'm pretty pumped about this. Here we go.
awesome awesome track man uh what a song that's super cool um it it kind of has a bit of a death cab for cutie feel to me which like huge soft spot in my heart for that band i love them um the early stuff uh you know the later stuff is cool too but i'm being that guy the early stuff um so yeah lots of great stuff here so you say in the comments here initial mix trying to incorporate more instrumentation while retaining vocal quality trying to weave a storyline as well hope you like so definitely like um what i would call this would would almost be like a rough mix from the day um so i could be totally wrong about this but it it sounds um, like you haven't quite entered the mixing stage yet because you're still adding instruments and everything. And that would make a lot of sense for the comments I'm about to give. So um, I'm going to comment on it as though it's a mix, but I think you're still in the rough mix stage. So um, some of this you're probably going to be like, I know, I know. Um, but hey, why are we here? So uh, yeah, the first thing comes out is there's a lot of low mid going on a lot of bass going on and it's it's just masking a lot of stuff so i'm hearing a lot of low mid um definitely in the vocal but also a lot you know it's it's kind of over everything but it's it's really clouding up our drum picture and we're not getting um especially like when we hit that wall of sound at the end we're not getting like a lot of punch and definition and clarity from the drums um the guitars have a good mid-range to them but um i'm not feeling uh, separation of the instruments in the middle. Um, that said, I really like where you sat the vocal for this. It's kind of recessed feeling and it's, um, smooth and easy to listen to. I really like that. Uh, when you got to the bridge, I was hearing a lot of sub on the picking. Um, so maybe taking down some low end or high passing that bass is going to help out to kind of clear some of that up. That might be a place to look at for low end. Um, just overall, like a lot of 80 to like 110 ish. There's a lot of like build up kind of happening there. And then again, uh, a lot of stuff happening around like 200, 220 or whatever. That's just kind of stealing all of our clarity away. Um, so, uh, Karen, um, Karen Bassett in the chat. Hey, Karen, uh, thanks for coming again. Um, had a chat that, or uh, she had a comment. She said, could use some hijacking uh, for a little more clarity. And then she corrected herself by saying high passing, not hijacking. Um, when you're high passing, you have to make sure that you don't hijack the bass, right? So I loved your typo because uh, it kind of brings up a point that um, if you start high passing everything and taking out all the bass and everything, um, like to go clean up that sub on the pick, for example, you might lose some of the thump in the bass. So just be cautious of that when you're cleaning all this stuff up, not to overdo it and just go for this massively clear thing, especially um, given the style of it too, like this more like kind of indie rock feel. Uh, if you make everything super clear and polished and all that stuff, it's going to leave the genre as well. So um, again, I'm kind of like commenting on this as though I think that you're still in a rough mix stage. I hope that that's uh, super useful. And if you um, want more uh, feedback on it, uh, feel free to comment on the Mixtank page. I'll get a notification in my email as well. So um, awesome track though. And please submit another mix of this one uh, for another review. I, I want to hear it. So um, I love where it's going. That's going to be a great track. Awesome. Okay. Oh, Mike. Uh, Mike, are you Studio Jiman? If so, thanks for being here, man. That's that's awesome. I love your stuff and when you submit it. So uh, you say, yes, Rough Mix, if that's you. So cool. All right. Um, Michael asks, is there still time to submit a mix? I'm finishing one and just submit it. Uh, yes, there's still time. So go, go get it in, Michael. Uh, we're doing it kind of random right now, but I'm going to end up going back through the chat here and picking some of the ones uh, for people that said that they're here. Uh, cool. And let's see if we got any other comments to address. Karen suggests that pre-delay might help with the lead vocal coming forward. That can be super useful with, with verb and everything. Awesome. Cool. Good to see you here, Mike. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Love your music. Okay. Drawing another track. Fleeting glimpse of a dark angel. Very were. Okay. Uh, no comments on this one. It says track status is master. So we're going to check it out. And here we go.
Okay, so I think that there's something going on. Um, it sounds like a tape transfer or something that sounds a little phasey. So I'm going to skip forward in the song um, and uh, just see if things change a bit. One second. Oh, yeah, you barely show your face and then you vanish once again. Dark angel, where do you Cool. Awesome. Okay. So, um, yeah, couple couple thoughts right off the uh, top there. There's a lot of noise going on. It's um, very bright. And like I was saying, something sounded kind of phasey, almost like it was a bad tape transfer. So if this is coming from another machine and you're, you know, um, maybe you're layering some stuff on it because I didn't, I think that the drums and maybe the bass didn't sound like they had quite the same um, issues going on. With, with some of the, like the thinness and a little bit of that phasey stuff. Uh, so if you're bringing the other tracks over from another format, just check your connections and make sure everything's cool there and you're getting like full fidelity from that. It could also be that that information's gone from the tape. Um, so if that's going on, you might consider um, redoing uh, that guitar and vocal and um, just seeing if uh, you can get a little bit of a clearer, uh, clearer tone out of it. Um, I did really like the delay that was going on in the lead vocal. That's pretty cool. That vocal felt like it was also sitting on the left, which, um, again, could be like weird wires, phasiness I was hearing, uh, could be from a bad transfer and all that. So, um, it also, uh, these are more production, um, uh, notes, but it sounded like the, uh, snare drum was off on the drum kit and, uh, the vocal and the guitar were getting more intense, especially toward that last chorus. So... I kind of wanted to hear the snare on. I wanted to hear a more aggressive jump performance that was matching the intensity of the guitar and the vocal. Uh, I'm totally guessing, but it almost sounds like the guitar and vocal were recorded separately on this other format and then brought on top of this. I could be completely wrong about that. Um, but I would um, say like this might be great to keep as a demo and then maybe reapproach it um, with things being a little bit more uh, dialed in in the recording process. Uh, other note I had was that it sounds like the, the drums might be like a mono overhead and that overhead sounded like it was really close to a cymbal because the relationship of that crash cymbal to the rest of the drums felt pretty intense. So if, uh, if you are doing like a mono overhead, just watch your placement and, you know, have the drummer play the kit, throw in a crash every once in a while and just try to find a really good spot for that microphone to sit. That's not going to get a lot of harshness from the cymbals and give you a more balanced picture of the kit. So I really hope that that's helpful, Barry. Um, feel free to drop a comment. I'll watch out for you to, um, if you have any more questions about it. I hope it can help. And there we go. Mark was here. And let's go, um, let's go up into the Karen likes the brushes on the drum. Sounds like brushes and sticks were used. Yeah, could be. Uh, Karen also says possibly a bridge or a B section. There you go. Um, I'm going to look up through the comments a little bit and see, we'll take one from somebody who's here in the track. Uh, Penny the Catful says, my mix is called Hector and you'll be in the chat for a little bit. All right, Penny, let's go see if we can find Hector. Hector, not typing, Hector. There we go. All right, from W. Stewart. Uh, this mix underwent a few revisions, mainly about the vocal tone and effects. Originally, I had a slightly different approach to the vocal, but got to a place where the producer and artist were really happy. That's a great place to be. I'm going to kick you into HD, and here we go. Hector drinks beer at his loving wife's headstone. He's grateful for the good times. He's grateful for the good times. 
He's grateful for the good times and he wants to come home. It was painless, it was peaceful, he was holding her hand. It was hard, but he knew it was part of a plan. They loved each other since the day that they met. Forever gets shorter the older you get. They crossed the great river at barely 19. Faces and hardships that they'd never seen Before there was money Was hard work and sweat Cold nights and long days But never regrets Hector drinks beer At his loving wife's headstone He's grateful for the good times. He's grateful for the good times. He's grateful for the good times and he wants to come home. Ooh, is that a baritone guitar? The year the frost came, they barely got through. Clung to each other like young lovers do From work in the fields That old run-down shack To the first hundred acres And the first Cadillac There were plenty of kids And they raised them upright Weddings and parties lasted all night. Quiet porch evenings, long walks at dawn, glasses of wine slowly sipped on. Awesome. I feel really bad for Hector. Um, Hector. I feel for you. That's, that's what this is. Awesome. Uh, great, great job on this, man. Um, really, really cool song, and the production is just killer. Um, I think I heard some baritone guitars in there. That was awesome. Uh, when it went down to those low notes, I felt really, really powerful. That was cool. Um, great, again, like really, really great, uh, great production in there. Um, just reading some of the comments right now. Okay, cool. So, uh, a couple, couple thoughts came to me as I was listening. So first one was that, um, that stereo slap delay that you have going on. That's awesome. I love the, uh, the idea and the effect behind it. It felt like the, the length of those delays might be a little bit long. Uh, they're pretty separated from the vocal and especially the one on the left for me felt like it was a little bright. Um, so I would play around with either the balance of those slaps, the timing of them, or the, um, just sort of tone characteristics of them. Maybe, maybe a little bit less detail on it. Um, super cool idea though. And I think you should, you should keep going with that. 
the mix overall feels extremely over widened and uh it feels like there's a stereo widener on there again um i say again because it happens a lot on on mixes and stuff because those things are again they're addictive they're like um they're like i don't know name a drug and that people like and then they overuse it and bad things happen one of those it's one of those um so when I, I was playing around with my monitor controller and I just summed it down to mono and I, I lose almost everything that's happening on the side. So um, those, those stereo widening tools, uh, they can be awesome in small doses. I use them, I, I love them too. Um, but uh, if you overcook it, they're doing some polarity things and um, flopping things out of phase that when you're listening on stereo, it gives you the impression that you know the mix is this wide but you sum it down to mono and everything goes away and you lose like guitars and all of that cool effect work that you did, all that kind of stuff. So I would just watch out for the stereo widening thing. Um, I could have used some more bottom in the track over well, or overall. It sounds like it was like tracked uh, really, really well. Um, but I wanted some more like kind of punch from the drums. I wanted things to feel a little bit more 3d and have more dimension to them and just bigger. Um, this is kind of a, kind of a production thing during tracking because I would with a song like this with a drum pattern like this uh, I would love like a long kick drum on it and this is something that I totally steal from the school of Vance Powell because he's a master of this um, the way that he's playing that pattern the kick drum especially in the verses can almost be like a bar long it can just be a long note uh, so during production a lot of times if if i'm tracking and i hear this kind of thing going on it'd be like oh it'd be really cool to have a long open kick drum sound you know and start taking stuff out of the drum taking the pillows away and opening up the tuning a little bit to just try and get it to you know have like a note value that kind of decays out um i love the sound of the snare i think the snare sounds amazing uh, you could also lengthen that a little bit. And I think that that could just be done by with compression. You could do like a parallel thing that just has um, really fast attack and a long release thing to just kind of add some decay onto it. Uh, specifically, like if you were doing into a reverb or something, that would also add some decay to it. Um, you might even consider doing some delay on the snare. Uh, those are all cool things that um, I'm basically just listing Vance Powell tricks at this point, but uh, he's amazing at, at all of these things, these sounds. Um, the center feels very carved up and kind of hollow to me. So it's almost like you're um, kind of over EQing things, but some of that can also be from the phasiness of the, the stereo widening stuff. Uh, a mono delay on that lead vocal could be really fun. And again, uh, because most of the stuff I'm hearing here comes from Vance Powell, who's a master at this style of music. Uh, I would encourage you to watch the Chris Stapleton video on Pure Mix, um, where Vance breaks down Tennessee whiskey and all of the things that he does to that. You can also hear a lot of that stuff that um, I'm kind of talking about in his start to finish videos too. Uh, but definitely watch some Vance Powell stuff on the site because uh, it's right up the alley for this. And um, the stereo slap delay thing, that's that's totally uh, a thing that Vance loves to do and gets really cool tone. So a uh, really, really cool song and um, hope it hope that this helps. Uh, it's on the way to a really great spot. So cool. Give my best to, uh, to Hector. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to check... Oh, Kenneth. Kenneth Wright is back. Uh, Kenneth is from Saturn. He attends a lot of our live streams and he's become my buddy in the chat. So welcome back, Kenneth. All right. Uh, let me see if I'm going to take another one from the chat right now. So let's see here. I saw uh, Jen Soljic uh, did Light Shines, dude. Light It Shines. Light It Shines version two. Says he's here in the chat. So let's hit it. Light. It shines V2. Let me copy that over here. All right, got you. So, Jen Soldrich, here we go.
So why is this one so loud? See the light, it shines out from my mouth. See demons, so why is this one so proud? See the light, it shines out from its mouth. never smell human, so why have you come round? See the light, it shines down. Awesome, Jen. Very cool. Um, sweet. Penny the Catful. Uh, glad it was useful. Uh, sweet. And let's let's dig in here. So, Jen, Jen Soldrich. Cool track. I love the the tone of this. Uh, this has so many possibilities for the mix that it's going to be a blast. And I, if I have one piece of advice, is to have a really good time with this because it's got so much going on, so many elements that can take the stage and and come forward and change scenes and all of that stuff i think that you could have a blast with this track um you know on overall uh i think that one of the first things to do with this would be um not not to say like scrap this completely but what if what if you were starting from scratch i would listen to this as you're rough and just kind of as as the song is going on write down the things that are important to you, um, things that you can imagine about it without listening too hard to like what's going on in your mix or listening to the mix too much. Just think about the song. Think about the things that are supposed to be huge and big and 
what what's the in your head what does this song sound like and i think if you develop that picture more and spend a little bit more um time just kind of dreaming it up i think that um the mix is going to benefit greatly from it you know i i um say that because i i think i hear a little bit of a lack of direction with where it's at right now um mostly because of how things are kind of sitting but also like what's going on melodically versus what has kind of tonal balance uh priority those kinds of things uh it's not about like making the greatest piano sound or the greatest drum sound or whatever it's about selling the song and, and building this huge you know um huge journey if you will uh so there was just kind of right off the bat i'll just kind of comment on this mix but that would be my overall thought is just take a moment and think about what this song sounds like in your head and then make that happen so think about what you want to do before you do it um if you feel like you have done that i'll, I'll like hear some comments on the mix um the uh instrument tuning feels a little bit off to me um especially in the beginning it didn't quite bother me as much toward the end but in the beginning i was uh definitely i think it's the piano that might be out of tune uh, maybe the bass i think it's the piano but some things sounded like they were rubbing against each other uh the main guitar line the kind of slidey part felt like it could have some some more space and i wrote down musically and spatially on my notes here so um spatially i think that it could just you know have some have an environment that it lives in or uh something that is kind of giving it some some spatial awareness uh where it doesn't just feel dry and kind of up the center um musically toward the beginning of it these are you know it's all like everything is uh subjective so um take this you know with a grain of salt or how you will or whatever but um musically i was feeling like that guitar could have a little bit more space in between the phrases and leave a little bit of room for something else to speak there that doesn't mean you need to add another instrument it just means that um sometimes the beauty is in between the notes uh and all that so i think that that could help um the uh the drums feel like they're panned out super wide so this is something that uh really helped me out a lot was when i stopped panning my overheads like full lcr or like left center right like everything's so wide uh plenty of people do that and they get great results so this isn't for everybody but um if you bring in the overheads a lot of times like i'll i'll usually pick in uh i got this is a trick that i picked up from dave pensado's um if you think of the rule of thirds as it applies to photography and then bring that to, sort of to the mix world, if you have like zero up the center and then maybe like 25, 50, 75 and a hundred for your width. Um, if you start thinking of like these, you know, I divide it up in like fours right across both sides of it. So I kind of think in terms of like these little, almost like guide poles along the side of the mix. Like if you looked at the picture grid on your camera and, uh, I use that a lot when I'm kind of like placing mono elements and it helps me out. Um, but the drums, if I find when I bring them in, even if it's like 75, if you want to go keep them really wide, you are leaving, you know, this 25% on the, the left and the right, you know, the far wide stuff that's open and available for anything that you want to throw that feels like it's going out of the side of the speaker or like if you want to put reverbs out there it just kind of leaves some space to put some other stuff where it's like the the edges of the speakers aren't quite as defined doing that makes me feel like i don't need stereo widening as much because i've got spaces to to throw other things and i don't feel like it makes the the mix more narrow i think it just kind of adds definition to it so that would be one thought is like the drums feel so wide that it's not letting other stuff speak i hear a little uh, widening going on so i think um that could help out with it uh in the drum blend um some things are kind of poking out here and there like um you know snare drum kick drum once in a while or like coming out of the mix some compression would help, but also just some balancing with it. So um, listen to the drum kit, you know, solo it up and just kind of listen to the balance of those mics and see see how it feels. Uh, lead vocal felt a little bit thin to me. You could bring up some body with it, but it also felt um, like dynamically it had some holes in it too. So on the quiet passages, the vocal would, you know, say if the vocal's here when you're kind of louder, in between words, it might kind of go like this and get away from me. So you can kind of reduce the amount of like sway it's doing front to back if you 
um, compression will obviously do that, but I'll also do like parallel compression. I love Devil Lock Deluxe on just the factory default setting. I'll blend that up uh, right into it, and it'll kind of add some some girth and some weight to the vocal as well. Uh, I loved how the main guitar felt like it got pushed back around 245, 250. It kind of like stepped back and uh, let some other things come into focus there. I felt like there could be a little more definition in the bass guitar. It feels a little disconnected from, say, like the drum kit, like it's sitting behind it and not like they're one rhythm section, one unit there. Uh, so I hope, I hope that that stuff helps. And then at 325, I heard an edit uh, in there where the crash symbol happened and then it went away really quickly. I think it went away on a bar line, um, which sometimes is a giveaway that you're, you're working in logic, but I could be wrong too. So just like fun trivia stuff to try and like pull out of mixes sometimes. Uh, but yeah. And then I think that there's strings or something around three minutes and 40 seconds. It sounded amazing. Uh, like the, the arrangement going on there was really cool. And I wanted to hear more of that. So those are the notes I had. Um, thank you so much for being in the chat and for submitting a mix. Um, that's awesome. I love this style and uh, I can't wait to see what you do with it. And I think that you've got um, a lot of possibilities uh, to have fun with it. And mainly, I would say, like, just have a really good time with this one and um, paint a picture, you know, because you've got all the elements to do so. So awesome. All right. Um, it says the song of yours, too. So great job on that. Well written. Okay um let's see so we'll go uh okay so hero has a question about the panning comment i did so um so you can pan the main sound 25 25 and put effects 50 50 to get a wider soundscape yeah so um hero when i say 25 25 the i know like the pro tools panner goes zero to 100 left and right um so not sure what DAW you're in but I, you know, just kind of taking the 100 and then dividing it down into chunks. And I don't always stick to that either. Um, sometimes I, I do kind of like, you know, once in a while, you just got to go like, if, if those are my goalposts, you still have to go like off the grid sometimes and just be like, screw the rules and breaking them all and have fun with it. Um, you shouldn't be like completely restricted to these guidelines or whatever, like these, these barriers, but, um, a lot of, I will still use it. And sometimes, uh, I'll even subdivide further where like, Let's say that 25 and 25 feels too wide for me if it's like a stereo whatever um, and I want to bring it in more, then I'll, I'll just cut 25 in half and uh, there's no like 12.5. So I would just go to 12 and I'll kind of bring it in that way. And um, usually it just kind of helps me to figure things out. But yeah, like by having these like kind of outside, if like 75 is kind of, you know, the widest stuff, like if I have two guitars and I want to pan them hard left and right, I'll kind of start around 75 and see if it's wide enough. And then I've got some extra space for um, still like any, any other stuff that I still want to hear kind of wrap around those guitars. And then other times you just got to break the rules and go hard left, hard right. But yeah, uh, I hope that that helps. Cool. Awesome. Uh, let's draw another track. I'm going to draw another track on this one. And... Um, if I'm missing anybody who put something into the chat that's on Mixtank, let me know and I'll hit it next. Let's draw a track. I didn't hit play yet. All right. Uh, this is Perfect Ride from Jay Allen. This is from seven days ago. I'm going to make sure I wasn't here already. I was here last week. So I'm going to draw a track again. Let me. Here we go. Mad at you. This is fresh. Five hours ago. Mo Gratton. Okay. So we got no comments from me. A couple comments from Sonic Science, from Tom Foolery. The men. Those guys are uh, great commenters on everything. Okay. So this is from Mo Gratton27. He's passionate. And this is a final mix. Um, it says, hey, folks, working on the final mix. And I'd really appreciate some advice. Thank you all in advance. All right. Let's check it out. Mad at you. Don't send me down the hole when I'm losing my soul Even if it's part of me Awesome, Michael, we'll hit it next Cool, Jacob Just as now I start to open Cool, Flandy Since the discovery of fire Humanity wonders as wonderer Haven't we ever lived through wires? Connections are slipping up further Quien me trae abajo esa mal eres tú 
las ojos bonitos y después aquí tú no sé cómo decirlo si en francés o español no quieres que aún me vaya te aviso me voy don't send me down the hall when I'm losing my soul even if it's part of making would you get me down the fail if I'm last and unfolded just as now I start to open but don't send me down the hall where I'm losing my soul even if it's part of making would you get me down the fail if I'm last and unfolded to live and Nosotros no está bien Lo mismo que hoy dices Lo dijiste ayer Estaba pensando en ti Pero creo que fallé No quiero caer al hoyo Te lo digo en inglés Oh, Pablo, don't tell me why It's never too soon When it's time to say goodbye We both know things were better off last night We used to sing and stand on something Don't send me down the hole When I'm losing my soul Even if it's part of making Would you get me down the fail if I'm last and unfolding? Just as now I start to open. But it'll send me down the hole where I'm losing my soul. Even if it's part of making. Would you get me down the fail if I'm last and unfolding? Just as now I start to live and now. ¿Qué pasará mañana? Es un plan particular ¿Quién dijo que la vida era medio fácil? Cada día hay que pelear Que desde niños no lo hacemos por dinero Dejas todo si te vas Encuéntrale a lo malo algo positivo Vino internacional Cool Awesome. Uh, that'll put you in a good mood. I'm going to go get a Corona. I'll be right back. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, awesome job. Thank you for submitting, Mo Grattan. Awesome. Um, cool. So I, uh, I was kind of checking out Sonic Science and, and Tom Fullery's comments here. Those guys always have great stuff to say. Um, so I would first take a look at the, uh, the lead vocal and it's sort of level of priority that you've given it in the mix. So um, the uh, especially on the style of music, that offbeat guitar thing is super important. Um, but it's it's sitting way over the vocal and it feels uh, stereoized to me. So I don't know that it needs to be. I think it could live um, a little bit more uh, defined, I suppose, not as diffuse over on the left. And then I think that the lead vocal is a little bit more important than um, it's been made here. So especially around like 45, we're leaving like, I think we're leaving a chorus section and entering another verse or something, but the level of the vocal really drops right there. And it feels very like recessed compared to everybody else. So um, overall, the drums, I think, uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was Sonic Science commented that they feel a little light. Uh, sometimes the hat seems loud. Um, yeah, so I would agree with Sonic on this, um, that the drums feel like they could be a little bit bigger to me. So uh, they're a big part of the groove. The groove is everything in the style. That's a huge thing that uh, you could take a look at. And then um, the other one was that rhythm guitar there. Uh, I know it's it's kind of like it's the bone. It's like the foundation and like the spine of the song. Uh, rhythmically, but I'm wondering if at times it could have a little bit of a change in volume so it doesn't feel quite as static. Uh, so maybe letting it come back a little bit in the mix um, in certain in certain spots. I think it might be a little loud overall, but again, this is like a stylistic thing too. Um, so yeah, I hope hope that that stuff helps. Uh, I loved your rhythmic placement between you know the offbeat guitar, the onbeat organ. That stuff is all really really cool and feels good. Tom pointed out uh, to watch out for sibilance on the vocal. Definitely, uh, there's definitely like some resonant sibilance going on in that vocal. So uh, just watch out for that. Very cool. Um, let me know if you got any questions on it. And 
<laughs> Great foxes. Gotta love angry songs done all brightly. You know a thing or two about that. <laughs> it's awesome. Cool. Uh, let's see. Um, Jacob Gorbin. Uh, I'm here with the perfect band. Awesome. We'll check it out. Yeah. Uh, very cool job, uh, Mo Grattan, Mo Grichon, 27. I'm going to leave a comment here. And that way I'll know if, uh, if you comment on it, if you need anything. I have to get my link. Hold on a second. There we go. And let's see. So who are we going to go to next? We got, uh, you said, I'm here with the perfect band, Jacob. So Jacob, we'll go check that out. And <laughs> Flandy Bob, Lana, not related to Archer, submitted yesterday following last week's review. Cool. Let's check it out, too. We'll go to that one after this. Uh, so Mark was here. Boom. All right. Copy that so I can use it again. And we'll hit Flandy Bob first here. He's higher up in the chat. So Flandy Bob. Lana, what the fuck do you want? Nice. <laughs> awesome. Uh, the WTF is for Mark. Not familiar with Archer, but now I want to watch it. You have to watch Archer. You, you're going to love it. Uh, okay, anyway, more cleaning of the 3K area, especially for the guitar and also lead vocals. Uh, there was no boost on anything, but I guess he has a harsh voice when recorded as I have similar issues with them with different mics and preamps. Cool. Uh, I also dialed down the verbs. Still not a dry mix, any stretch of the imagination. I guess everything was drowning. Uh, sorry, I'm mumbling through the words here. We checked this one out on last week's stream, so this is um, revision from last week, so I'm excited Excited to hear this. Worked on the balance and automation. Thanks. Okay, let's check it out. Here we go. Lana!
Man, killer song. I'm so glad we got to like check that one out again. Thanks again for uh, for submitting, Flandy. That's that's awesome. Um, okay, yeah. So I think this has come quite a bit of a way from from what I remember last week. Um, very cool. So you mentioned uh, you worked on the 3K area, especially for the guitar and also lead vocals. Uh, no boost or anything. He has a harsh voice. So uh, he has an amazing voice. That that is a hell of a singer. Um, but yeah, like he, he has like that peaky thing that can be problematic, uh, from time to time, um, for us nerds. Uh, okay. So the, the main thing that sticks out to me now, um, we'll come back to the symbol and stuff, uh, in a second, but, uh, the main thing that's kind of sticking out to me, and this is totally style and all of that, like, um, subjective, no two people will ever mix a song the same way, all of that stuff. There's the disclaimers. Um, the cymbals and the drums feel very wide to me. So uh, if I'm thinking of like the stage that you've set here, the drummer just has all of this room to like float around the kit and explore the space, right? But, uh, you know, and he's hitting the hi-hat, I'm hearing it really far over on my right um, uh, with him playing and then... Uh, the symbols feel kind of wide, like the space around it, the toms, all of that stuff feel feels very wide to me. Uh, if if I were approaching this mix, I would want. I feel like all of that ambient stuff that that's in the mix, and I love that about the production and the style and everything that's going on there. And I think that you've nailed it all. To give more of an emphasis to that, I would tuck the drums in more, and uh, kind of what I just was rambling about, you know, for for a while, a, a little bit ago about like. Um, where I kind of like position things in the field, but just, I would tuck those guys in more to let them have a pinpointed position on stage. And I would make like, um, those pads and everything go wider and feel like more epic and really kind of build that sense of outer space and all of that. Um, it's totally a stylistic choice. And, uh, I heard a, a funny thing last week. Oh, it was during our live stream with Joe Ciccarelli. Um, he was saying, Chris Lord Algae told him one time, the fastest way to get fired from a mix is to change the panning from the rough mix. And uh, that, I think, is totally true. And you could be firing me right now, and I don't even know because I'm talking to a camera into the void. But you have a chat room, so tell me in the chat room. Um, I love how spacey this is, though, and I think it's great. Uh, so uh, I think that you did a great job controlling those 3K peaks of the vocal. Um, maybe it's a little bit too much, uh, and sometimes it feels really tamed. Um, but then other times there's peaks that pop out, like at 231, where I kind of went back to check it out. He's got one of those peaks that kind of comes out and jabs you. Now, completely taking all of that stuff away and making it like the super smooth vocal can can also wreck a mix. Like if you listen to some of the the stuff in this genre that you love, vocals have a uh, presence like that and they, they can like have a poke and it helps them cut through the mix sometimes. And, um, I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction to overly neuter things. Um, but even like with some of the treatment that's been done every once in a while, there's still things. So, uh, same thing with like sibilance on here. I hear that you've dealt with a lot of sibilance, but I don't know. He's, he's got, you know, kind of, it's almost like he's got two ranges of S's. Um, some of them on here sound like they're de-essed and sometimes pretty harshly, uh, where maybe you want to automate the de a little bit. And then other times it sounds like there's not a de -esser. So it sounds like that resonant peak is kind of moving around in the, in the spectrum a little bit. Um, again, this is a great time for automation. So uh, it's boring, laborious work, but sometimes you got to go through the entire vocal um, and it helps once it's sitting in the mix because you, you need to know where everything else is to be able to, you know, gauge how loud some of that stuff should be. But um, just listen through and, uh, you know, when I'm listening to it on here, I'm not listening for sibilance. I'm just trying to listen to the song and then anything that jumps out to me or pulls me or suspends disbelief, those are the things that I want to comment on and, and kind of bring up over this. So I would say like approach it that same way. And if you hear an S that jumps out and hits you, um, just make a note of it, drop a marker in, in pro tools or whatever DAW and don't hit it right then. Just keep listening. And then, you know, next time something bugs you, just drop a marker and then go back through and, and kind of deal with those things. I wouldn't go like syllable by syllable and like, you know, get really hardcore about it. Just, it only needs to be the stuff that jumps out to you. Um, 
231, I wrote that you could automate an EQ to take care of that resonant peak. So um, this goes back. I talked a little bit last week about um, the difference between dealing with a temporary problem with a permanent solution and then, you know, vice versa. So uh, permanent solution is a DSer strapped across the track, no automation, just always, you know, there and doing things. Soothe is a permanent solution that's always strapped across the track and deals with things in a temporary way, but it's always there. And sometimes it's doing more than you want it to. Um, but being being very precise about these things and automating them when you hear them, when you want them, uh, can really go a long way with it. So automation's key. Um, then other than that, I, I think like this feels really cool. The guitar um, it felt really good to me in the solo. Uh, at first, I was wondering if it could be wider or should be wider, but um, not drenching it in reverb is cool too, and it felt really good. Uh, Tom had some really great moments that I think are worth pointing out here too. Um, the, uh, he had a comment about the acoustic, um, and then, uh, sometimes like tape stuff, helping to smooth some of that stuff out that can be cool. And then the one I wanted to bring relevance to, was, uh, yeah. So the drum compression, I would agree with his comments and say, like, try some of those out. It's also going to depend on if you play with the space of the drums and then there was another one he said that I wanted to say something about. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm going to let it go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. His comment at the very end. Uh, I think the feel largely is there on this and it's enjoyable to just listen through. That was my thought too. Sorry. Um, it's enjoyable to just listen to the song. So I, you know, job well done. Awesome. I hope that that helps and uh, let me know. Cool. Uh, thanks again for tuning in too. Thanks for being on the on the call, and uh, I hope you get to check out Archer soon. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what else have we got here. Uh, there was another person that I wanted to hit their mix. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, cool. That's awesome, Vandy. Uh, congrats on on the new edition. Um, depending on how new, but yeah, congrats. Okay, uh, Jacob Corbin, The Perfect Band. Let's check that out. Let me just put that over in here. If you are here in the chat and we haven't got to your mix yet, please let me know and we'll hit it. Okay, this one's from Gary Prague. This is uh, Fresh, The Perfect Van Band, version 9. So new rhythm guitars, added shakers, then mixed everything according to suggestions from Mark and other reviewers. Uh, improved dynamics by limiting less on the master on the master bus. Made everything drier. I'm not sure of too much. Looking for overall feedback on what needs fixing. Okay, let's check it out. Here we go.
Awesome. Very cool. Great job, Gray. Uh, Gray Prague. Um, sorry if I called you Gary before. I don't know if I called you Gary. Um, okay, so very cool. Uh, yeah, so Great Fox had a good comment here. Uh, vocals are sort of low in the first verse, I would agree. Um, and let me go back here. So Jacob, um, yes. So Jacob's your name. I just remembered it's in the chat. Okay, awesome. Thank you for being here, Jacob. Um, so I think uh, I am hearing like a lot of um, improvement from last week. There's uh, the big thing that's jumping out to me right now is the the snare drum level. So um, I think the snare sounds great. It's a cool sounding snare drum, um, but right now it's it's very loud to me. Uh, it's like right on the top, and um, I love like the name of the song is the perfect band and and all that, and like that's the the whole thing. The um, I had like this really like crazy thought that I thought was kind of funny, but I, I don't like mean to be uh, offending in any way. Like I had a thought because the snare drum feels uh, so loud to me that if this perfect band, like if they had a concert poster, it would be a cartoon snare drum with like a cartoon face on it. And like, he's got, you know, a stick like holding a microphone or whatever, but the snare drum is a star because the snare drum is a star of the mix on here for me. So, um, I think we need to rework the poster a little bit and maybe bring the snare drum back uh, so that it's not quite the star of the show. Um, as great as that snare drum does sound, uh, I think it could come back a little bit. And I think it's going to be fine sitting back. I don't think it's going to lose any of its power or anything like that because it, it feels like a really good tone. Um, the, uh, the thing about the snare drum being so loud is, especially with this groove that you've got going, um, it's providing like backbeat support, but we're not hearing like the subdivision in between. And then we've got a very syncopated thing happening in the rhythm guitar. So I'm, um, with it being that loud, I'm struggling to find the groove of the song that keeps the track pushing forward, which you added the shaker, which kind of helps out with that because we get some more subdivision, right? But um, throughout the song, I kind of wanted to hear some more of that subdivision because it's going to push it and make the track feel faster, uh, which I think will be, be really cool for this, even though it's got like a very like, uh, you know, sort of a halftime feel on the drums um but yeah the uh you said you improve by dynamics by limiting less on the master bus so um i had a thought uh while i was listening and i don't know that you need to like go faders down and rebalance this but if you have um trim mode available to you in your daw uh definitely put the snare in trim in case you're like automating it throw it in trim and then um just try bringing that fader bring it all the way down and then bring it up into the mix, like decide uh, again, like who's the star of the show, who's on that poster and uh, start bringing the snare up and decide like where it's supposed to live in, you know, relationship to everybody else. Who's the star? Who needs to be front and center? If everybody's front and center, um, that's OK, too. But then the snare needs to come back and let other people kind of be there and like create that wall of sound. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the space feels good to me, though. And um that's that's feeling pretty cool. The um, the space meaning like the ambience of the track. The drums feel a little wide to me, and uh, I would agree with Sonic Science's comment here that the tom wideness has some phase issues coming for it. Uh, so when he kind of does like the tom fills, I'm not hearing like punch and definition and tone from the tom. I'm just kind of like hearing attack and a little bit of smearing. So just check out what's happening with the toms there. Um, they feel a little phasey or a little bit wide. Uh, I would agree with this bass comment too. It, um, I didn't notice the bass in the track when I was listening. I don't have any like recollection of the bass tone or um, what was going on with it. So maybe there's something more interesting to happen there. I think if you bring that snare drum back, it's going to um, help maybe define some of those other things. Uh, and it'll probably give you some, some answers on where to go next with it. Um, I don't feel like you're super far and like the, I see like version nine on there. Um, don't get burned out on it. Like still, still have a good time with it. And if you need to take some, some space from it, do that. But, um, I only say that cause version nine, like I know that feeling when it gets there. So, uh, you know, like really definitely have fun with it. I think, uh, it's come a long way and I hope that this helps out too. Um, I, uh, if you have any more questions, um, hit me up in the mixed tank comments. I'm going to put my comment in here. 
so I get notified if you do. And uh, please let me know if I can help more. Um, yeah, big thing for me, bring the snare down, and then let's see let's see where it goes. I'd love to hear it again. So uh, shoot, shoot a comment on there, and let's stay in touch about it. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next song. Oh, uh, Karen Bassett has a question in chat. Can you describe what phasing means and what causes it? It seems to come up a lot. Yes, um, so phasey. So uh, Karen, if you take, I don't, um, I don't know what kind of plugins you have, but any kind of like S1 Widener or like um, Brainworks has it on a lot of their plugins, like a stereo width control, and you can crank that up to like sometimes 200% and it gets like super, super wide. Uh, there's a thing that happens with it because the way that they accomplish that is by taking the signal that's in the left and the right, and uh, usually it's the difference. So um, let me go up a level here in, in explanation. So we have uh, something called mid-side processing where you have like just the center signal and then you have what's on the sides. So mastering engineers uh, were kind of the ones, I think, who started using this mostly, but um, you can do this as a recording technique too. And basically uh, they have the ability to affect what's in the center, which what is in the center, because we only have two speakers, um, the reason that we hear a center in our image is because the information on the left speaker and the right speaker is the exact same. It's arriving at our ears at hopefully the same time at the same volume. And that gives us the perception that it's happening between the speakers. The stuff that doesn't happen in both the left and the right speaker defines the image of the stereo field. So any difference from the left and the right speaker is going to be telling us something is in stereo. So if we pan something all the way over to the left side, it's playing 100% of the left speaker. There's nothing of that existing in the right. As we bring it into the center, we're increasing the level in the other, the opposite speaker. And that gives us the you know perception that it happens a little bit closer to the center. When you take um, the difference between the left and the right, and you start to rotate the polarity, you start getting this feeling of like a wider image, like it's going outside of the speakers. But that feeling uh, or that like taking it out of phase gives us this very like washy um, kind of like it's got holes in it. If you've ever like double mic the guitar amp, that's a great place to learn about phase. Take You can even do it with 257s or 258s or just two microphones, whatever. Put both those microphones on the speaker and then slowly bring one back and like, kind of listen in headphones you could do it with a radio too it doesn't have to be like a guitar amp um, just take two microphones point them at a source and then slowly move them in relation to each other and you'll start hearing the phase difference between those those two sources and the same thing applies to the stereo field so if if things start going out of um out of phase not polarity but out of phase uh you'll start hearing like a phasey phaser you know kind of sound happening outside of the speakers um, at first that sound is kind of like compression. It's hard to hear at first and you, you do a little bit of it. You get this wider feeling. It's addictive. It feels great. This is, this is all like my opinion piece at this point, right? So I'm, uh, I'm doing what our major news networks do and just giving you opinion at the moment, but you start, uh, feeling, you start feeling like it's coming out of the speakers, getting a little washy, um, or you start feeling like it's coming out of the speakers and it feels cool. So you do more of it. And then, it, you know, you have like these big wide mixes. Eventually you start processing that sound again, in my opinion, and um, it starts to feel unnatural and uh, kind of like it's got holes in it or like it's artificially coming from outside of the speakers. So that's a lot of what I mean. Like the, um, the Tom thing feeling phasey, the Toms don't sound natural to me because they start getting holes in them like comb filtering. Um, if you're familiar with that. So I hope that that helps. Um, Great Fox says it's L minus R and then R minus L, like an old Logic Pro, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, that is correct. Um, and Karen, let me know if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can also hear it like drum overheads are really, really, um, you know, that's like a place that you hear phase issues a lot. Like if the drum overheads are, not in phase with each other or the the rest of the kit, you start getting this like super wide thing that doesn't feel natural and things start getting hollow because the drums are comb filtering uh, between the two overheads. Um, but any kind of like multi mic thing, these are all things that you need to worry about. And then like it also uh, relates to mixing as well. So I hope that that helps. Um, I, I use things that widen all the time though. And, uh, 
it's it's not like I don't use any of it, so I don't I don't want to give that impression either. Um, usually, if I want to widen a source, I'll use something like uh, MicroShift, um, which can also have a phasey sound if you kind of overcook it, um, uh, or like an H910 is really cool. And lately, in um, place of using kind of like phasey phase boxes that kind of do that kind of stuff or chorus boxes, um, I've been doing a lot of like slap delay kind of things too to try and try and simulate some of that stuff but yeah like microshift is cool h910 is cool um i even use one from infected mushroom called wider that one doesn't seem to offend me too much but i use it very sparingly too uh and a lot of that is all all taste um yes yeah, so cancellation at certain frequencies is comb filtering um yes and mark tarleton perfect yeah phasey to me is like out of focus similar to a photograph that is blurred that's exactly perfect um so like if we do this, my face being blurred right now, um, that's how phasey feels to me. It feels like everything is diffuse and out of focus. So great job uh, pointing that out, Mark. That's that's really great. Um, that's exactly what it feels like. So uh, yeah, hope that that helps. And that is something I hear it a lot on a lot of mixes on here. And um, yeah, it's just, just something to watch out for. Uh, maybe you don't have any stereo widening going on, um, Jacob. Uh, Maybe let us let us know in the chat. I don't know what might be happening through that. Uh, oh, okay, so Jacob, you said, uh, I now think that I may have listened to it at too low of a volume. Um, the comment from last time that you might have listened to it at too high a volume. Um, you should, so uh, jumping jumping back to Jacob real quick about the snare thing and, and listening levels. Um, if, if you're listening at a low level, I feel like you should hear that snare drum jumping out to you. Uh, if not, it could be a monitor placement thing or if you're on headphones. Uh, Jacob, let me know in the, in the chat if you're mixing on headphones. Um, this kind of stuff is really hard for me to personally get on headphones. Like I, I, have, I struggle with vocal level. I struggle with snare level on headphones. And general balance is a lot harder for me on headphones. But those two in particular seem to, seem to be tough for me. Um, Cool. So Isomatic says, I love wider. That's the one I use the most. Uh, and also this one called Spread Light. I'm going to check out Spread Light. That sounds cool. Awesome. Uh, all right. Let's see. Michael, um, I'm going to check out yours next. You're in the, in the chat here. And uh, This Is The Day is the name of the song. So let's go over to it. Uh, Jacob, I'm, I'm still watching for your comments. So if you can put it in there, let me know. This is the day, Michael. Awesome. We got it. Um, I'll just keep watching the chat and we'll, we'll talk more about it afterwards. Cool. Uh, Marcos, if you're still in the chat, let me know. You had a question before the stream started that we can chat about in a minute. And it is about 4.15 ish right now. Um, I usually try to wrap up around 4.30 Eastern. Uh, let's hit a couple more mixes. If you guys got questions, if you want to talk more general stuff, put it in the chat. And let me know, and we'll keep going. Here we go. There's this guy who pumps gas on the full serve island. He's always got a big smile on his face. And when your tank is low, Souls running on empty He'll drop you off and send you on your way With a verse from the good book Maybe Luke or John Got gas pumping, gospel preacher Loves to sing this song This is the day the Lord has made I'll rejoice in it It's a day God has made Rejoice, yeah sure there are better jobs than this But I'll do mine with joy and happiness Cause this is the day the Lord has made I'll rejoice in it It's a day God has made Rejoice! No pulpit and no Bible Just a squeegee and a rag He'll check your oil Windshield clean, and as he airs up your tires, that greasy. 
see one man quiet Burst into some Psalm 118 Skeptics and cynics can't help but sing along It's kind of contagious when he starts to sing this song This is the day the Lord has made I'll rejoice in it It's a day God has made Rejoice with all its hassles and reasons to complain Work to do and bills we gotta pay Still, this is the day the Lord has made I'll rejoice in it Another day God has made Rejoice! Sure, I've got problems, everybody does Now this song may not solve them Still I sing it just because This is the day if I fall down I'll pick myself right up off the ground This is the day, rain or shine No matter what, I'm gonna be fine This is the day, even if it pours I'll find a way to weather the storm fun at the end. Rejoice! Okay, right there, I was just listening for that last syllable um, on rejoice. I felt like I was missing the S on rejoice. So uh, maybe check that out. And yeah, so number one thing uh, jumping out to me on this one, it's actually the same comment as the last one. I feel like the snare is um, sitting in front of everybody. It's the star of the show here. So um you know, one thing I'm I'm doing, and I mentioned uh, Jacob actually brought this up um, that I mentioned it last time on his track. Um, I'll bring the volume down super super low um, to hear stuff like this, and it's just a thing where um, for me, if I'm mixing for like if I'm having a really long day and I've been mixing for a while, my ears are you know kind of dying on me or whatever. Um, I'll lower the monitor volume, uh, not to like a whisper, but pretty close, just really low. Um, just not so that you're like struggling to hear it, period, but I'll bring it down, you know, pretty far that I can hear the transients jumping out and the differences in balance uh, with that stuff. So the snare, um, you know, it's almost like, like if I have a, a mastered thing off of Spotify playing at a low volume, I feel like everything is kind of like at a static low volume, right? Um, depending on the mix quality and, and all of that stuff. But when I imagine like listening to a record and like turning down the volume, I, I just kind of expect everything to be down at that volume. So when I turn down my monitors while I'm mixing, if I hear things once in a while kind of poke out and jump out to me, that tells me that something might be up. So unless it's intentional. Um, but the snare drum, when I bring this guy down, the snare drum sitting in front of everybody, sometimes poking out uh, a little over top of it. So, um, I, again, like, uh, for me, it's all about deciding like who's important in the mix and what role do they serve? Um, this one, uh, I would, I would consider bringing that, especially from the style and everything, I would consider bringing the drums and the snare back a little bit and bringing up the other elements of it. Um, the organ felt like it was a good level to me and like a good relationship. So, uh, I don't think like that, you know, needed to come up and maybe some of the other stuff too. The vocal felt like it was a little bit buried, 
most of this stuff is just like balance stuff. So not even commenting on any kind of like bus compression stuff or anything like that. Just deciding the priority of the instruments and where they sit. Um, one thing that I thought was cool about this is I felt like I was um, on an island, like, you know, on a patio somewhere, like listening to the to the band perform. And um, I feel like it has a vibe and a brightness to it. Um, not tonally shelving high, the high shelving or whatever. I'm just talking like the feeling of it is very like it's a bright, open ocean feeling to me, like a sunny day at the beach. Um, so that is awesome. Like you've gotten that and I, um, I wouldn't like mess with that too much. But I would just think about like if I was watching this band, I wouldn't want the drums to be so loud. And a lot of times if you go to see like local bands and stuff like that, the drums are always super loud because that's really exciting for a live sound engineer to push their PA um, rant over. <laughs> but yeah, for me right now, the drums are the star. I think that they need to come back a little bit. Um, the toms, when they were going through fills, they didn't feel like events to me because there wasn't a lot of tone to them. They felt pretty thin and like there was just a lot of attack to it. Uh, so I would take a look at the tom sound. Um and then coming out of the bridge, you have this uh, distorted vocal thing happening in the bridge that feels really cool. It's a nice scene change, um, meaning like there's difference in the bridge and it, it feels nice that things are, you know, getting keeping my interest and changing and all that stuff. Um, coming out of that bridge, the vocal felt low to me. Uh, so the bridge vocals louder or more exciting than the chorus vocal. And uh, especially going into that final chorus, we need to feel like we're elevating to a new place. So uh, chorus three needs to pop a little bit more and just watch out for the, the level between the bridge vocal and the last vocal. Hope that helps. And I hope that you win your mixing contest over at Tournamix. Uh, yeah, I hope, it, um, hope that that's useful, Michael. Um, I'm going to comment on here. And if you have any questions about anything I said, uh, drop them in there. And I know you're in the chat too. So thank you so much for hanging out and watching today too. Really appreciate it. Uh, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> thanks, Flandy. Yeah, I'm not fired. Thank you. Uh, Flandy says, okay, I'm all caught up. Uh, thanks for the great review. Definitely not firing you. I don't care what CLA has to say about it. Take that, CLA. Uh, okay, so, oh, Jeff said, uh, so cool. How'd you make the B3 sound like a steel drum? Yeah, man, that's that's definitely awesome. There's, yeah, all kinds of really cool stuff happening in here. Um, great job, Michael. Just, yeah, the balance thing is like the biggest thing that I have to comment on. Um, sell me on the song, sell me, uh, on, on who's, who's leading the train here. So, uh, oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So Karen, Karen has a, um, thing on here. She says she puts it on the horror tones, uh, and walks around uh, and does stuff while listening. Anything sticks out, she goes and fixes it. That's that's really, really, really great advice. So, um, Michael, uh, Jacob, both of you guys, this, this might be cool for both of you. Um, so she's calling them horror tones, and um, that's that's a good name for them. Uh, she's referring to, if you're not familiar with them, aura tones. And aura tones look like these guys right here. Um I just want the picture, but it's going to try and sell me a pair. Uh, now I'm going to get ads for these every day. Okay. Um, they look like this, and they're just mid-range. It, it sounds like a TV speaker, basically, right? But the cool thing about these is they really help you dial in the mid-range and balances um, like really, really well. I like them a lot. I have a pair of, um, they're called baritones. And then I've also heard the ref tones, I think they are. Uh, and they all serve the same purpose. Um, you just find one that you like. The Oratones are like, you know, kind of considered the guys. Um, it's kind of the same principle as like NS10s. It helps you dial in balance in the mid range and all that. So uh, I think it's worth um, worth a look. And if you don't want to go get a pair of horror tones, um, you could just find a, an old mid rangey speaker. Um, some of the Bose stuff that people talk about using, a lot of times that'll have a lot of extra bass and stuff. And a lot of what we're going for here is the mid-range. This will, um, I feel like if we popped it up on Oratones, you would hear the snare thing really, really quick on that. So uh, maybe check that out. That might be a really good, really good look. Or um, if you can airplay to like a TV or to your phone uh, or like load up the, the mix on your phone and listen to it on there. That'll, that'll also give you a good reference of it. But yeah, great. I'm glad you pointed that out, Karen. Um, she said she got hers back in the nineties when you did audio posts for TV. 
I know that world. That's awesome. I was in uh, the mid 2000s doing audio post, and oratones are super helpful. Uh, Kenneth has aventones. Yeah, aventones are good. Um, sweet. And Michael says the way he got that organ sounding that way was good hertz wow control. They make super killer stuff. Awesome. You're very welcome, Michael. Cool. Uh, yeah, I hope that that is all useful. Um, anybody in the chat, if I've missed your mix and you told me that it's in there, tell me again uh, now and I'll, I'll hit it before we get out of here. And if not, I'm going to draw a track. Um, Marcos, I don't know if you're still here. If you are, tell me in the chat and we'll hit your question from before the stream. Uh, cool. Yeah, definitely love listening low, um, Karen. Another thing I've been kind of into lately, I, I mix on speakers for probably like, um, sometimes a hundred percent of the mix, but, uh, I would say like 95% of the mix on a normal basis, but I've been kind of relying on headphones more as like a last pass, um, on a mix. And it's kind of interesting, the stuff that will still jump out to me, even though like I love my speakers and I trust my room and all that. Um, I find like just doing one little final tweak pass on headphones and then you can even do a save as if you want to test this, but like, uh, then if I take off the headphones and listen on speakers, I'm like, oh yeah, I dig it more. So, um, just multiple listening sources in general is really, really useful. Uh, let's see. I don't see anybody else in the comments yet. Uh, so I'm just going to draw a track and if, uh, nobody comments, this might be our last one. Let's see what we got here. Uh, we just hit that one before. Um, sweet. Okay, so I'm going to drop my comment. And we'll do a draw track. This is the day we just listened to. Um, we got this one earlier. Got this one earlier. See, we might have gotten through it all. We got that one earlier. Let me pop out of the draw track stuff. Let's go with newest. Refresh. Here we go. Um, okay, so this one's from 10 minutes ago. Yep, we'll hit this one. So this is from uh, Tizanov. And I don't see any other ones posted. So yeah, let's do it. Here we go. This is Keep the Light On from Tizanov. I'll be leaving tonight. Don't know when I'll be back. Take the long way around on a spiraling track. Might be stuck in reverse. You know I got more to do. If you're feeling alone, know that I feel it too. Could have been happy here, I was running in place You're there's something I long for now that I'm in the race Drew my heart on a note, and I left it behind Knowing you'll keep it safe here one day at a time But I know
I know that song. Uh, awesome. So that song is from Jakir King's Start to Finish uh, featuring um, uh, Keep the Light On is the name of the song. And I have to look it up. I'm so embarrassed. Uh, I was there on the shoot for this. And it was Start to Finish, Start to Finish, Start to Finish. Oak and Dash. Uh, great, great band uh, produced by Jakir King. So this is the, the series page. So you guys can get to it. Go to series Oak and Dash by Jakir King. And um, you watch them go literally from the demo of the song to the final uh, final mix of the whole thing. Those are some really fun days. That was filmed at Flux Studios at uh, Fab's place on his new 55 series console uh, and mixed there as well. And uh, you can download the song and mix it and do all the things. Um, very cool. Uh, so I know this song really, really well. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, let's chat about some stuff that feels really cool. The um, the bridge felt like it had a lot of power, which was awesome. Um, I definitely dig that. Karen, I see you in the chat. Uh, fight your computer back. I'd love to check out a mix for you. Um, cool, sorry. Uh, squirrel. Okay. Um, so the... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that, that is happening. Like in the bridge, I felt like there was a lot of power and excitement um, going on. Uh, I like the distortion that you lead, used on the lead vocal. There was some cool things happening there. Um, I'm going to just jump into some like overall stuff and some, some uh, things to try. So uh, one, I love that you downloaded this and that you're doing the mix. And we even had a mixing contest for this ages ago. So I love that you're doing it outside of a mixing contest for practice. Good for you. That's awesome. Um, that's the, yeah, just the fastest way to improve is just keep practicing like that. Uh, and okay. So from the, from the start, um, overall, I'm hearing a lot of over compression on the bus, uh, limiting. It's very loud. I don't think it needs to be quite as loud. Um, it's a very dynamic rock song. Uh, there's a lot of nuance in what the players are playing, even though it's not like a jazz thing. Um, they're really good musicians and they have a lot of nuance on it. Um, my first impressions were that the snare, uh, the snare jumped out. It feels very, very weak and very thin. Um, not a lot of tone to it. And, uh, because I know the song so well, and I know the track so well. Um, I know that the, uh, the natural sound of it is actually really good. Um, so I would just look at the processing that's going on there. Uh, the guitars feel very, very loud to me. Um, it's uh, the guitar show in this case. So um, I had a joke from earlier about uh, if there was a poster for this band, um, this one would be like cartoon guitars and be like, come see us play. Because uh, I'm being told that they're the most important thing in the mix by how loud they are and how like overpowering they are to, to everything else. So balance is going to be a big one here. Um, and I would suggest like take all the stuff, um, the parallel or the compression, the limiting, um, the stuff that's happening on your stereo bus, um, take it down or release it, like bring the threshold up on all of that stuff and just work on the balance before doing any of that stuff. And um, uh, I get like people mix into their, their stereo bus compression limiting. I, I, that's awesome. Um, but they uh, typically like are watching how hard they're pegging it um, as it's going on too. So if, if you like to mix into that stuff, that's totally cool. But try to get a balance first, then dial in your stereo bus compressor and your limiter, um, and then continue on mixing. Um, balance is uh, kind of the theme for today. But yeah, um, guitars feel loud to me. The, uh, the vocal feels nasally, uh, like it's got too much compression. It's kind of causing some problems with that. Um, uh, and it almost sounds like there's a bit of a pull tech thing going on, uh, where there's like too much boost on the bottom and too much boost on the top. Uh, but somehow it still has like some of the honk in the center of it. Um, so check out, check out the vocal tone on there. The, uh, vocal delay that leads into the first chorus is, um, a really cool idea right now. It's distracting me but I love that you tried to make a moment out of it. And I would say continue down that path and see if you can find something that um, isn't distracting to the listener, but just helps us do the transition. 
um, s- subtle goes a long way on these things. Uh, but still, like, I, um, it's great that you're you're taking a shot at it. Uh, Joe, in our live stream last week, Joe Ciccarelli, we were wrapping up uh, the mixing contest for Alanis Morissette's Guardian, and he produced the song as well as mixed it. And he was commenting that um, he was a little bummed out that uh, all of the mixes that he heard were kind of staying true to the song. And he wanted to hear people take some more chances with it, uh, to hear some stuff that like maybe he couldn't have come up with and other people would find it a different way. Um, stuff like that, like those little kind of moments are, are a lot of that stuff. And um, while they might not always get approved or might not always work, it shows that you're trying to like kind of add something and, and elevate the track. So you don't have to go overboard with that stuff, but it's cool that you took a chance. Keep going with it. Uh, lots of 2K in the guitars and the chorus are a little harsh. Um, that could be coming from other stuff that's being boosted or cut uh, in, in the EQ thing. So um, take a look at overall what you have on the processing. Don't just like dip out 2K, but take a look at the whole. Uh, I felt like there needed to be more subdivision in the drums. So I wanted to hear some of the notes that are happening on the hat. Uh, I know that there's a lot of electronic percussion that keeps stuff going. There's a crash cymbal that's being ridden in the, uh, on the bridge, I know. And then I think uh, coming out of the bridge into the last chorus, he's riding a floor tom. And I remember the toms in this session sounding really, really great. Like, I love the tone that they got on them. And I remember on the shoot, I was really surprised that Jakir threw up Audix D6 microphones on on the toms. Um it was a funny thing for me because the D6 is a kick drum microphone. And the only time that I would pull that out of the mic locker on sessions was if I was doing a metal band because I didn't like the um, the curve that was on it. I felt like it was too drastic and uh, it just wasn't, wasn't the style that I personally like to go for on a lot of stuff. Um, but there were times that I would pull it out and use it. Uh, but anyway, like I was surprised because he put Audix D6 on the rack in the floor tom. And when I saw him do that, I was like, whoa, that's interesting. I never would have thought to put those up on toms um, because I generally am not even a big fan on the kick drum, but I wonder what is going to happen there. And when I heard the toms, I freaked out because they sounded so good. Uh, And I immediately jumped online and bought myself three Audix D6 to use on toms in sessions or whatever. So uh, those toms... um, cost me, you know, about $500 or so, um, because I love the sound of them so much. And in this mix, I'm not hearing all of that tone and the things that got me excited about them. Uh, so, um, I, I, yeah, I think just take a look at at what's happening with the toms on there and and make sure that there's moments happening, like for the, you know, like the rise coming out of that bridge into the last chorus and all that kind of stuff. Um, the bridge focal uh, feels recessed to me compared to the last chorus. So the the last chorus, the final chorus vocal is is really really loud. Um, Jeff, thanks for coming, man. See you see you later. Uh, from Hollywood, awesome, cool. Uh, yeah, the last chorus, the vocal feels really really loud on there. Um, so just check out the relationship of that. It's jumping out of the speakers a little bit again, like low volume or tones, iPhone speaker, all those things can help. And uh, for the vocal, if you want to get it um, compressed and exciting, uh, try some parallel compression on that and just blend up a parallel compressor into it and see if it helps. So, yeah, I hope that, hope that all helps. Um, and then the other thing, too, um, the songs up on Spotify, or if you can find a, um, a download of it, uh, bring it into your session as like the rough mix and compare it to that as you're going along and use that as like, a, you know, you don't have to match it. That's not the point. Um, but use it as a reference for what the producer felt was important and cool. Thanks so much for submitting. It was cool to hear that song again. It's been a little while for me. Okay. Um, let me see if anybody got any other things in here. And okay. I don't think we got any more. Let me just double check one more time. Karen, you're fighting with your computer. I remember uh, I'm just going to look and see if Karen got her song in or not. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that that's going to wrap it up for us today. Um, so yeah, uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, a couple upcoming things. We have a video next Friday, Andrew Shep's compression typology. That one's 
super useful. It's Andrew going through all the different types of compressors, explaining the tonal differences, how they operate, things like feedback and feed forward compression. Uh, all of that gets discussed, which is really cool. Um, this week, the the monthly or the uh, weekly newsletter is going to be a takeover from John Paterno. So that'll be really great. Watch your inbox for that. And then um, just a reminder that, uh, oh, uh, let me look at the thing here again. Uh, we are going to be switching to bi-weekly for this live stream and adding another live stream. So uh, I apologize. Next week, we will be here. So I will be back next Monday, 2.30 p.m. Then we're going to start going bi-monthly. So I'll be here next next Monday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, um, the 29th. And then we'll be off for Labor Day on the, September the 5th. And then we'll be back on September 12th. So I'm still here next week. I hope to see you guys here. And uh, yeah, we'll chat then. All right. Guys, thank you so much for, for joining and uh, submitting all your mixes and everything. I uh, have a blast every week doing this and, and really appreciate you being here. Um, great, again, to see you guys in the, uh, in the chat, too, like everybody that keeps showing up. So, cool. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.